Hello ELIC30, this is Michael, and we are in How to Be Human, An Autistic Man's Guide to Life, continuing Chapter 2, beginning at the bottom of page 17. Jory Fleming on Jory Fleming. Jory. I don't exactly introduce myself as, Hi, I'm Autistic Jory. How are you today? A lot of people don't know I am autistic. If I've known someone for a while, it will usually come out at some point. I'll also bring it up myself if it's relevant or if for some reason it impairs my ability to do a task in a group. But it's not what I say to people I'm meeting for the first time. It's not really useful information. I also feel like it's different than having a physical illness. You can address an illness. If you have cancer, you might be cured of cancer, depending on the type of cancer, of course. There's a possible future where that illness is not present. Knowing that fact changes your reaction. You immediately see an illness as a negative. You think, I'm not in a state of health because I have this illness. But with autism, this is just my state. There is no other state, and there is no future possibility of a different state, so there's nothing more to think about. I certainly wouldn't want to wear a scarlet letter for autism so that everybody knows I have autism when I speak with them. Pause. Okay, scarlet letter. He's referring to a famous novel by the American author Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, the title of the no novel is The Scarlet Letter. So uh, the, the scarlet letter is a symbol for something uh, negative, something bad, maybe a, sin a terrible sinful act that a person has performed. Um, <coughs> and that's what he is making reference to here. Continuing on. The best comparison I can make is that because of my metabolic condition, I have never tasted Hardy's Monster Thick Burger with 107 grams of fat or a slice of triple chocolate cake. I have no idea what they would taste like. I know that they exist, I've seen commercials, but I have no actual knowledge, no conception of what they are. But I also don't sit around thinking about Hardy's Monster Thick Burger or a slice of triple chocolate cake. If I could eat them, perhaps I would think about them more. In that analogy, having autism as opposed to being neurotypical isn't a huge irritation. It's more like every now and again you're reminded that everyone else gets the burger or the chocolate cake. You sit at a table and realize everyone else is ordering off a different menu and is able to share what they ordered while there is nothing on the menu for you. You think, oh, I'm not part of that. But it only happens now and again, and you just move on. Then you just move on. It's not helpful to dwell on it because nothing will change. It's just the way things are. L.W. How do you describe yourself? Jory. My Twitter bio says I'm an enigmatic and eccentric thinker. If I was describing myself and telling somebody more than just the sort of factual sequence of events, I would probably talk about that. I'm a walking trivia storehouse. I love facts. I love reading the news, listening to podcasts, just absorbing stuff. I really like to see people thinking about large-scale world problems, environmental problems, social problems. I like to think that problems can be solved. I'm really interested in meeting other people that feel the same way. I generally consider myself to be kind of a strange person. 
I like to have fun, but not in the ways that other people like to have fun, typically. I like to play board games. I like to talk about weird things. I hate small talk. I like to hang out with other people with similar lines of interest. I don't like meeting strangers. If you become my friend, you'll know that you're part of a small group, but one that I value really highly. I like to meet people, but I don't like to call many folks my friends. I'm sort of a mixed extrovert and introvert in that regard. I don't necessarily mind meeting other people, but I like to choose who I spend time with. If somebody is interested more in me, I might tell them about some of my disabilities. Although, if I was just meeting somebody, I don't think I would unless they asked. I also usually don't introduce myself as religious, but if somebody else likes to think about religion, then I do like to talk to people about that as well. But I don't like to lead off with that necessarily. Just because I say I'm religious, I won't try to convert you and that kind of thing. But if somebody else likes to talk about those things, I like to talk about them. I'm very curious. I'd probably start by saying, I'm from South Carolina. Family basics. Usually I would mention college because I'm meeting other people of a similar age at this point. Then I would talk about what I study and why I study that. If I like them, I can go on forever about that with no problem. I would say something, something to the effect that I consider myself to be from South Carolina and my family comes from Kentucky. I have two older brothers and a younger sister, and if somebody wants details, I would say I was homeschooled since the second grade, and my mom was my teacher for all that time. She was an excellent teacher. I rode a lot in homeschool and got to find out what my interests were. I liked to play tennis, still do from time to time. In homeschool, I found out that I really liked geography, so that's what I decided to study. And it conveniently worked out that the, sc that the school right down the road had one of the best programs for that, so I started at the University of South Carolina. I added marine science after I met my academic advisor and learned to love that as well. From that came my interest in technology and science and the world. That journey took me on some very unexpected paths. I applied for some scholarships and ended up in England. I know the value of education from experience and I recognized that between therapy and mom homeschooling me, I had a lot of very active interventions in terms of educational assistance in that regard. On one level, my transition from nearly nonverbal to, you know, whatever this is, being over here studying on a Rhodes Scholarship was not like me just flipping a switch in a room by myself in the dark. It was very much a constructed experience, and I was, n I was not the one constructing it. In some cases, I was being helped along on the journey by mom and many others. That stands out really strongly to me, because even though my memories of that process are not very good, I understand the effort involved, and it also really saddens me that not everybody has that support, but I think they should. Jory's Journey How did Jory develop from being a child who dreaded getting on the school bus to becoming 
a fully engaged college student and a Rhodes Scholar studying at Oxford. How does he describe his personal journey? How does he talk about autism? And what does he think about the idea of curing it? L.W. Do you remember when you were told that you had autism or when you understood what it meant? Jory. No, because there was never a moment when little me was at Dr. C's office and I understood what was going on. I vaguely remember weird things like tests and developmental checkups. I vaguely understood that she was not a sickness doctor, but a different kind of doctor. When I was being homeschooled, I suppose I knew I had autism, but it wasn't until late middle school and high school when I sort of conceptually understood what autism was. When I started going to youth group at church, another guy there had autism. It was interesting because while he had autism, it wasn't the same. There were some differences and some similarities. So I sort of thought about it then. My mom never really, at least to my knowledge, sat me down and said, here is the exhaustive list of your conditions and what that means. There was never an Information 101 session. I still have to ask her questions, and doctors often speak quickly when trying to explain things, which makes what they are saying more difficult to follow. Over time with autism, there was a process of self-discovery, I suppose you would call it, although I tend to think less about autism because my other disabilities are much more obvious and place more limits on me than I, that I notice. The limits from autism at this point are very internalized. I know that I have no idea about emotions, and to compensate for that, I have tried to build filters to make sure I think an extra bit about what I am going to say so I don't accidentally stomp all over someone emotionally. I can also still be unaware of the consequences of language, but at least I had a certain intention, and language I chose was very intentional. I may have made a really bad miscalculation in how it would be perceived, but it was still an active choice. Everything I do is active. But to be quite honest, when I started college, I didn't really tell anybody that I had autism. Later on, some people that I had gotten to know relatively well because we were in student groups and saw each other very regularly in class, I would tell them. I came up with a brief description because quite a number of people had not met or had only sort of secondhand met someone with autism. I, I had an elevator speech in which I tended to focus on how it's less comfortable for me to be in social interactions, that conversations could be difficult, and that I would miss things like social or body cues and emotional reactions and states. These are the things I'm not good at in particular. I kept it at a very summary level because I thought it was helpful for people to know what I'm not good at so they wouldn't feel weird if a situation came up and I was acting differently. 
Before that, I didn't really think about what it meant to have autism. It just was. L.W. What made you want to engage with the world around you, to push through the barriers and participate and communicate? Jury. Relatively early on, some part of me recognized that even though the world was not set up for me and I did not like it in many instances, I still wanted to be part of it. And to be a part of it, I had to be in control and had to play by the rules that the larger system constructs. It's hard work, but this is something that is valuable to me. It's going to mean increased engagement with friends and things of that nature, so I'm going to do it. There was also a recognition that if I don't have control and adverse consequences are happening as a result, the logical thing to do is attempt to gain some control. But I feel like any ascribed motivations were pretty simple. There was no complexity, no deep philosophical impulse, I think, therefore I am, or anything like crazy like that. It's more that there are some adverse consequences and I could reduce that. A pause. Uh, I think, therefore, I am. Have you heard that expression? Uh, this was an expression by the French philosopher René Descartes, who was trying to figure out how to prove whether or not he himself existed. This was part of a larger philosophical problem that he that he was dealing with. So, but he finally uh, realized that. Cogito ergo sum. Okay, I think I am. Um, and that was uh, Descartes' uh, beginning of his philosophical quest to prove that anything uh, a actually exists. Okay, we'll stop there and uh, we'll continue the, the uh, chapter in the next video.